All right, some people have some early flights, so I'm just gonna get started. I got one little last final talk, little last final talk, maybe that's an hour or maybe 20 minutes if I can get it done as fast as I want. Um, I wanna start with some stuff that John had told me about to tell people because that would be easier for me to keep my brain on track. So there's a guy from Mexico, or guy, girl, Mexico, Dubai, and Denmark. Thank you for traveling out here. I am amazed by that. I really appreciate it. I know two of you. Uh, John had said people had asked him about remote coaching courses and pre-order. Uh, talk to John about all of those things. I'm assuming that's what putting these on the list means. Uh, the shirts are on pre-order on the website. And then if you need more info, maybe during the Q&A that would make sense to ask about. We could answer any specific questions. All right, I got two little lessons and then I'm gonna go back to my story uh, to conclude the weekend. All right, so first, is keeping your ego in check. I, this actually has become really popular in the market. I, I don't know if it's what my messaging is or if because I read a lot of the books from Stoicism and that has kind of been ingrained in my psyche, but uh, keeping control of your ego is something that's commonly talked about now. The ego is the enemy. Ryan Holiday's written books about it. Somebody, two people actually have sent me or asked me if I have read that. Um, just during the camp. And one thing I wanted to bring to people's attention, and this is in a room of people that are probably the some of the best in the world in the sport. Does anyone know who the starting quarterback of the losers of the 1998 Super Bowl is? Ah, you fuckers. All right. <laughs> Did anyone else besides those two know? All right, who took silver medal in the world triathlon in 2007? No one? <laughs> Fourth in the 2013 CrossFit Games, which is more relevant. Huh? All right, we got two people that knew in a room of 100. Huh? I can't hear you. Yeah, that's true. He's fourth, 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 fourth. All right, all right. More relevant to what most people do. Fifth successful, most successful business owner in the CrossFit space. Yes, thank you. Number five. Five on the list. So what the point there is, is like, we're, I mean, most people in here, if you have your best case scenario, your best season, doesn't really matter. And nobody's going to remember it. They might remember it in the short term. If you really are a superstar, you'll be permanently in the media infrastructure on YouTube. But the reality is having an ego that is completely out of check is one of the reason most people have performance anxiety on game day. And I know that because I've battled the enormous ego inside of my own mind that is completely unnecessary. So you show up and you're like, oh my God, what are these people thinking? What are they gonna think if I fail? What, what's gonna happen if they see me on the leaderboard? No one gives a shit. They're all focused on their own worlds and their own stuff. And that is what I think most people need to have in the context of their own mind, that the people that they do this for should be important to them. Fame and impact on a broad scale are very transient. History is very transient and it's rewritten over time. But I'm sure, Everybody in here, I put a, something relevant to sport, like, if, I mean, if you're from the States, the star football player on your high school football team. Most people, or like the star basketball player, most people remember that person more than they do these other sport goals that people have accomplished that were way harder than just being the star of a high school football team, because it's close and it's relevant. And most people remember the people from their family. I put the people who raised them because I don't, some people don't have, you know, traditional home lives, but those are the people that you make an impact with. And that is one of the most potent performance enhancers to go through suffering. So have in the context of your mind that you should keep your ego in check and have a real reason, something really profound and meaningful to you if you want to get better at sport or just life in general. I think it's a good context or perspective or skew to go after. Then take it seriously. So the initial talk, the scatterbrain discussion that was talking about how sport and life are intertwined. I got this quote from Nelson Mandela. I wish I could do his voice, but I can't. Sport has the power to change the world. 
It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to the youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than government in breaking down barriers. And that's true. World Cup brings people together. The Olympics brings people together. And more relevant to us, CrossFit brought a lot of people together. It brought people from the weightlifting community, the gymnastics community, the endurance community, the physique community, all together to share ideas about how to upgrade the fitness market in general. And that's something that I had to learn the hard way because I had a lot of criticism from a lot of people close to me about why, why are you using your brain to help people work out fast? That's what people would ask me. I'm like, you are not supportive, friends. But it's true. And it took me a while to realize how much of an impact I could make in people's lives and watching how much of an impact the people close to me had in other people's lives in getting in shape, getting fit, being able to push through suffering and making their psyches more resilient to stress in life because stress is always going to happen in life. So I'm assuming if you're all here for the open prep camp that at the minimum you're going to go through this year's open. And I would hope that you take it seriously, that you really put your best foot forward and do everything that you can to do as well as you poss possibly can. It's so easy to give up. Mike talk, put in his talk how so many people check out. We, we will have probably 50 inquiries for remote coaching in the middle of the open because people are upset about where their placing is before it's even over. And that's just not the right mentality to have. If you're in it, be in it and do everything that you possibly can. And then when it's over, figure out what happens. All right. So back to the wizard. <laughs> I'm just going to talk about the Wizard of Oz for the rest of my life. That's going to be my new profession. Um, I am the wizard. This is my face over the wizard's face. I don't know how to use, I was going to ask Chris how to help me, but I don't know how to use Photoshop, so I just screenshotted it and put it in there myself. <laughs> I should have like went around my big bald dome better, but I don't know how. Anyways, my ego, the ego that I battled my whole life are these things on the left-hand side. And they were criticisms. I think at some point in my life, I probably had people say those criticisms to me, but eventually my intensity took over those things and made that part of my internal dialogue. So I remember growing up, I got chubby and you get made fun of and teased by your family and a family of athletes like, oh, you look, you look like a little cabana boy, like the fat little cabana boy in an athletic family. And that fucked my shit up in my head. I'm like, I know it's funny now and I laugh about it, but I really had a serious fucking issues about it. And so I decided at some point, I'm gonna be a great athlete and I'm gonna get lean. And I did those things really well for a while. Or my parents, they ran a, a kind of a, a business that was like Nutrisystems when we were younger. And it blew up and exploded and then there was some sort of credit problem and we went bankrupt when I was five. So we went from being in like one of the wealthiest areas in Westchester County, multiple cars, my dad had a plane, he used to take us out and fly in the plane and then bam, no money. Everything was gone. All we had was a house and a Ford Taurus uh, for the whole family. My, my mother commuted to Boston every week and I would basically see her on the weekends. My dad commuted to Philly every day and I would walk to elementary school, walk home, my brother and sister would take care of me, my dad would come home at the end of the day. And so I vowed not to be poor because of that experience. I learned over time that money wasn't the construct that was going to make me happy or give me the freedom that I wanted or, or reconcile some of these insecurities, but at the time it was what shaped and molded my behaviors. Being weird, I... <laughs> I, that I still am. I'm fucking weird and I'm okay with it. Um, I've always been a little bit strange. Like I go to parties and people wanted to be friends with me and I wouldn't know what to say. They like come up and talk to me and I'd be like, Whoa. like small, the concept of small talk doesn't make sense to me. Be like, oh, hey, how you doing? And I would just be honest. I'd be like, yeah, I'm having a kind of a shitty day. And they're like, <laughs> It was getting away from me. And I was like, what the fuck? Was it? No one tell the truth? Uh, and I had a really hard time reconciling, like, how am I going to make my place in this world if I'm weird? I'm going to be socially acceptable. 
I'm going to be the person that people want to be. That's what I tried to become. Quitter and lazy. Um, those things are true. I think there's because I was just very sensitive uh, and experiences were kind of traumatic. I maybe didn't have the guidance I needed to reconcile tough experiences in my life. So things would happen to me. And instead of what I try to do, I don't know if I do it successfully, but if somebody I coach has a bad experience in life, I try to talk them through it. Like, okay, this sucks. What decision do you have to make about where you want to go moving forward? Instead of that, I'm more, I was more rational in my past. So it's like, oh, I'm unhappy with this. I'm done. Just like that. And so I became kind of a quitter without knowing that I was being a quitter. And then eventually when I started looking in the mirror enough, I realized I don't want to be that. So I tried to become the hardest worker of anybody that I knew. And I found anybody that worked hard and I tried to do more than them. And at first I was kind of faking it. Like people were like, oh, read books. And I'd sit in my room. I think I read my first book cover to cover when I was 19 or 20. Um, and it took me like two months to get through a book and I'd read like 20 pages and be like, what the hell did I just read? And I have to go back and reread it. I mean, my mind is always scattered. So it took me a really long time to harness my focus to be able to pay attention. And then sensitive. Um, I have a strange relationship with pain because things have always hurt, but at some stage in my life, I kind of got turned on by the idea that I could take more pain than other people. I like, I don't know how that happened, but then I started to encounter the fatigue that you feel in CrossFit and the crippling, emasculating feeling of trying to stand on your own two feet and do another rep with a 45 pound barbell and not being strong to pick it up. And that started to break my psyche a little bit. So I started to be like, okay, well, I need to figure out how to get enduring at a better level so that doesn't happen to me. And that shaped the wizard. I was basically chasing to be the wizard. But the twist of this whole story comes back to the Wizard of Oz, is that I'm actually Dorothy in this story. <laughs> I wish I had a wig to put on. I don't mean that I'm Bruce Jenner and I'm coming out as a female. <laughs> I just mean metaphorically I'm Dorothy in this story. So I didn't really get to the end of The Wizard of Oz yet. I just said, oh, here's the end. And then, oh, no, no, this also happened. And in the end is that Dorothy wakes up and she realizes that all of the people that were in her fantasy, that were in her little adventure in Oz, they were all the people in her life. So they all came, like she was in the bedside. I guess something happened in the tornado. Like she passed out and somehow happened to be alive and in the bed and whatever. And the family came around and they all started talking to her. And like her uncle was the lion or the, you know, the person that she saw in the beginning was a tin man. I don't know the details, not important because I write the narrative of this story where I'm Dorothy. And what I took away from this was that Dorothy created an adventure in her mind where she perceived all the flaws of the people around her that were her loved ones. But when shit hit the fan in her life and she wakes up from this illusion where she was very critical about who they are, there's still the people by her side supporting her and they cared about her health. And that's what I realized over time in my quest is that people and the people that I'm surrounded with and the people that I've been lucky enough to surround myself have been the thing that helped create the wizard illusion in the external market. But really, I'm just a girl running through. <laughs> I'm just the metaphorical Dorothy running around with a bunch of other flawed people trying to figure out how to make ends meet and trying to figure out how to make this ship sail. And I try to leverage all the skill sets of the people that are around me that are way better at doing other things than I am. I'm not even sure what my actual skill set is, other than being insane enough that people laugh at me when I stand in front of a crowd. So maybe I'm like a shitty comedian or something. <laughs> but I know that I bring some value to the organization and I'm very conscious of the value that the other people in my organization bring to me. So that brings me to a concept. And I wanted to have some sort of a meaning 
teaching point to give to the camp that really extended beyond fitness, that extended about how I perceive the world. And this is the final chapter, the end of the story, the end of the narrative. So people's language shape how they perceive the world. They say if you actually need to understand a culture, you, have to need, to, you need to learn their language. Because the way that you think about things, like when you have dreams, you're hearing them in our words and, and in our society's way of defining things. And one of the concepts that I've struggled with my whole life is love. Not that I don't feel love or that I don't have love in my life because I have a lot of it and I have more than enough and I don't need to be loved by anybody else, I'm happy. <laughs> but watching what people use is that term. And our society has a singular term for it. And the Greeks, they had six forms of love. I don't know if this is accurate. Maybe there's some literal people that are gonna come up and be like, you're wrong, there were eight. This isn't right, regardless. The six that they had were one that was related to sexual passion. In all culture, we don't really talk about sex that much publicly, but whatever, that was one. A deep friendship was another. A playful love, which was like the initial courting process, the flirting, the excitement, not being super connected, just that initial process of getting to know somebody. The fourth was a love for everyone, a feeling that you had probably something similar to what the Buddhists talk about when they talk about love meditations and sending love out and sending energy out. A fifth, which was a longstanding love, which I would probably consider something like family or a really long marriage that gets defended, that gets developed over time. And then the sixth was the love of self. So those six, they shaped the Greeks' definitions of love in their own society. I don't know what's appropriate, and I don't know, you know, if we need to improve the lexicon of the English language to have more languages of love, but I, have come to find one in my life that has really solidified how meaningful this brand is to me or this this quest that we're going after. And it comes from an oral tradition of the Polynesians. And there's no real writings about it because obviously it was an oral tradition and it was all storytelling. And it's called Teo. And in their culture, supposedly, I don't know exactly if we'd ever find whether or not this is right or wrong, if it's, you know, kind of a dead history. But supposedly, you could be bonded through Teo, what they called Teo, in a ceremony to a brother in battle. And it was only brotherhood. It was punishable by death if you separated your Teo bond with another one of your fellow warriors but you could get divorced without punishment. So obviously in their society, it was probably one of the most important forms of love. And that's something that I have realized. And I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to say I've been through battle, but my life and my internal psyche has been a war my whole life. I'm not somebody that just like wakes up and it's comfortable and I go through my day to day. I'm always in a fight. And I always set my goals to make it a fight. Maybe that's a way for me to keep engaged in the world. But I realized over time that I was becoming bonded to my employees for helping me helping me hold myself accountable, right? I didn't want my coaches to look at me and be like, man, he works all the time and his life sucks and he's not figuring out how to make time for himself and he's not training and that accountability to that. My athletes, to me, going to a competition, I've been to a lot of really, really painful, bad competitions where things didn't go well and you're watching people's dreams shatter and standing there helplessly, knowing you can't say anything or do anything to make the feeling better. But you work through those and you recreate dreams moving forward and you make the decision consciously to step into battle. So I put this concept out here because this is something that has helped make my life meaningful. And it's something that I hope I could share with people so that they could develop a brotherhood. And maybe it's through training Think Tank, Maybe it's through observing and having the best training think tank athletes representing part of your season. Maybe it's with your coach. Maybe it's with your training partner. But I'm hoping to be able to in some way give you permission to experience a form of love that's different or give you a word to explain a feeling that you might have that might not be normally socially acceptable in our current culture. So the final point after this 
is do it for others. There's a movie that I saw about Sudanese um, refugees, and I actually talked to Travis about this a little bit um, and sent it to him after I saw the movie. And it said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that that's true, and that's my concluding point for the camp. If you want to crush the open, whether it's this year, whether it's next year, whether it's the year after, whether it's building a business, you need people, and you need really fucking good people. And I've been lucky enough to have good people. And I've been lucky enough to have good people that have good people as their support structures outside of who I am. And that is the primary reason that I've become the wizard and realized that in the process, I'm Dorothy. So that's it.